Lord, if you go with me to 1 Peter chapter number 2, 1 Peter chapter number 2, also find uh, Proverbs chapter number 3, please. 1 Peter chapter number 2, and then Proverbs chapter number 3. Now, I will tell you, I really have enjoyed watching Texas Tech play basketball this year. Uh, it's been a joy, but they're not my team. My team is North Carolina. I've been a North Carolina Tar Heel fan uh, all of my life. And I'm not just a, you know how CJ is a Cowboy fan? That's the way I am about North Carolina. Uh, but we always win, so it's easy to, it's easy. We are a blue blood, you know, and uh, uh, we are really playing well yesterday. I, uh, I used to, when I was in my 20s, I would watch basketball pacing back and forth, yelling and screaming at the TV and, and all of that stuff. Well, I don't do that anymore. For the last several years, for many years, I've been able just to sit and watch and enjoy the game. Uh, but uh, yesterday, there was a little difference. I'm telling you what, uh, I uh, was a little behind uh, because I, I, I started on DVR, and so uh, I started watching it, and when we got into the second half, we were fixing to blow out the Baylor Baptist. I'm just telling you, this North Carolina Tar Heels Liberal University was fixing to blow out the Southern Baptist Baylor Bears. I mean, it was, we were up by 25 points. Our, our three-point shooter was just draining it. And I'm telling you, if you play basketball and if you ever shoot, there is sometimes you throw it up there and it looks like and it feels like you throw it in at a building this big. Getting that right, Blake? I mean, there's times you just can't miss it. And he was stroking it, brother. Well, there'd been a little guy on Baylor that was needling all the guys underneath, and so my guy went under there, and he kind of threw a high elbow up and hit him in his face. Well, they kicked him out. <laughs> yeah. And uh, we were up 25 with 10 minutes to go, and I told CJ, we're going to lose this thing. And uh, I started watching it, and I'm telling you, it immediately turned. And in that 10 minutes... We almost lost it. Baylor tied it up at the end of the game. It was tied, and it went into overtime. And uh, I got back to my old ways. I was up pacing. I was yelling at my TV, and CJ said, you know, you need to be a little quiet so the neighbors don't think we're fighting and calling the police. I've got a little heater that I keep by my chair just because I like it. It reminds me of a gas heater. I put my feet up there. I was wanting several times to go over and just kick that thing, you know, but I thought it costs too much money to kick and destroy, so I better not do that, and, and got towards the end, and luckily I was behind because I fast forward through some of that. I just couldn't take it. My heart was just pounding too much, and when we went into overtime, I said to myself, there is no way in the world we can win this game, but we did. <laughs> Hallelujah. And so anyway, but I will go home and you don't want to start watching it till I get home, okay? No, when I get, okay. Y'all want to say, we'll have a little fight here. All right, let's get into this thing. First Peter chapter number two, verse number 11 and verse number 12 is our text from uh, the book of Peter tonight. But I want you to notice the wording that he uses because he's changing the subject. Remember last week he was talking about the church. And now he's going to talk to the church. And, and, but notice these, uh, the terms of endearment. Beloved or dearly beloved, I beseech you, I urge you, I beg you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust, which war against the soul, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, that ye may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of your visitation. Now, I'm just going to deal with these two verses, but, but I believe these two verses are an introduction to what he is going to write about from verse number 13 all the way through chapter 3 and verse number 12. And the thing that he is going to talk about is submission. Because verse number 13, what does he say? Submit yourselves to every ordinance. Verse number 16, the Bible says, as free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. Verse number 18, servants be subject to your masters with all fear. And then verse number 21, down through verse number 25, he talks about the example that Jesus Christ gave us in submission. 
And then in verse number 3 down through verse number 7, or, verse, or chapter 3, verse number 1 down through verse number 7, he is talking about marriage and he's saying, Wives, be subject or submit to your own husbands. And then in verse number 8 through verse number 12, I, I believe he's talking about as Christians we are to submit to one another as the Apostle Paul says in Ephesians chapter 5 in verse number 20 where he says, Submit ye to one another. Paul or Peter puts it this way in verse number 8. Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. So a big portion of the book of Peter is going to be talking about submission. That is the theme of those verses, but, but I think he uses verse number 12, in verse, or verse 11 and verse number 12, to set the stage to kind of introduce what he is going to talk about. Thus, I have entitled my message tonight, Control. Who has it? Control. Who has it? Right quick, before we begin, turn with me back to, and hold your finger in Peter because we'll come back there. Proverbs chapter 3, verse number 5, is a passage hopefully all of us can quote by memory. It says this, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding, and all, all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. When I was growing up, it was kind of popular when you, uh, for especially young people, when they would go to a, and maybe a youth meeting or a youth camp, and there was a, a kind of a quote-unquote famous preacher that would come in. It, it was kind of popular for kids to gather around him and, and have him sign their Bible. And most of the time when a preacher would sign your Bible, under it they would put a life verse. You might be saying, well, what is a life verse? A life verse is a verse that when you read it or you hear it, or you think about it in your mind, it captures how you live your life, how you defined your faith walk, and what will lead your decisions each day. So a life verse is really important. I, I don't know if you have a life verse, but, but if you don't, maybe this week you ought to kind of think about what is a, what is a verse in the Bible that, that, that would help me in my life and, and remind me of the direction that I'm walking in life. You have 31,173 verses to choose from, so it's not going to be an easy task. But I think one of the verses that ought to be a life verse is this verse that is found in Proverbs chapter 3 and verse number 9, or 5 and 6, where it says, Trust in the Lord with all of thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding, but in all of thy ways acknowledge him. I think we can simplify those two verses and just say it this way. Let God be in control of your life. Now, when I got saved, I didn't just add Jesus to my life. I remember when I got saved, I, I just didn't punch a ticket to heaven, but when I got saved, I asked Jesus to come into my heart and to take over my life, and I told him that I would let him rule and control my life. I don't know about you, but you know what? That's what salvation is. Salvation is saying, Jesus, I want you to come into my heart and, and I want you to take over my life and, and I'm willing to follow you. I'm willing to do whatever you want me to do. If you want to do an interesting study, the next time you read through the book of Acts, every time you find this phrase, you ought to underline it or highlight it and here is the phrase, the Lord Jesus Christ. Over and over and over in the book of Acts, when they talk about Jesus, they refer to Jesus as the Lord Jesus Christ. What they were saying is, Jesus, hey, you're going to rule my life. Jesus, you are going to reign in my life. Hey, Jesus, you are in control of my life. This morning we got to observe one of the ordinances of the church, and that is baptism. But baptism is more than just coming up and getting wet. But baptism is a public acknowledgement that you are a follower of Jesus Christ and that Jesus Christ is going to be in control of your life. We say, buried in the likeness of his death, raised in the likeness of his resurrection. It is a public declaration that Jesus is in charge of our life. 
Not only do we get Jesus, but we get the Holy Spirit of God. When you get saved, the book of Ephesians tells us that, that God gives us the Spirit. The Spirit of God comes in to indwell us as a guarantee that He is going to keep His Word to us, as a guarantee that we are saved. And Paul says this in Ephesians 5 and verse number 18, And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled, and we know that that word filled means to be controlled, or be controlled with the Spirit. Paul is saying, hey, don't be controlled by the flesh. Don't be controlled by this world, but, but allow the Holy Spirit of God that is living inside of you to control your life. When I got saved, I started out really good. Man, I listened to the leading of the Spirit, and I listened to the conviction of the Spirit, and, and I allowed the Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit to control my life. But, but as time went on, I took back some of that control. As I got older and I became wiser and more knowledgeable in the way that this world operated, I began to think, you know what? I don't have to allow the Lord to control my life. I can control my own life. The Apostle Paul had that battle in his mind in Romans chapter number 7. In Romans chapter number 7, he says, you know what? I know what is right to do. I think we could put it this way. The Apostle Paul knew that it was right for the Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit of God to control his life. But he goes on and he says this, even though I know it's right to do, I, I don't always do that which is right. He says the flesh and the spirit, they struggle. They're, they're at war with one another. I know that it's true because it's happened in my life. I have not always allowed Jesus and the Holy Spirit of God to control my life. Odd part of my life, I've tried to take over the controls, and, and I've decided to what I wanted to do. But what did the verse say? Trust in the Lord. Allow the Lord to control your life, and, and lean not into your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct thy path. You see, I think if all of us would be honest with ourselves tonight, all of us would say, you know what? There are times in my life when I take back control because I dislike it. You know, it's not a modern problem. It's this problem as old as this world. You read in Isaiah chapter number 14, Satan is in heaven, and boy, at that time he was the morning star, and boy, he had everything going his way, but, but the Bible says that he decided that he didn't want to be second anymore, and he didn't want to submit to God anymore. He wanted to take over. Here is what the Bible says in Isaiah 14. He says, For thou hast said in thine heart, talking about Satan, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will set upon the mount of the congregation and the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. You know what Satan was saying? I'm going to be in control of my life. I'm not going to listen and submit to God anymore. You look in the Garden of Eden. The first temptation that man had to endure was this temptation of control because God said, you know what? You can have everything in this garden. You can eat of all the trees, but this one tree of knowledge of good and evil, I don't want you to eat of that tree. Satan came along and, and ultimately said, you know what? God is trying to take control out of your hands. He's trying to tell you what to do, and, and you can't be a God like that. If you will eat of the fruit, then you can be like God. You can be in control of your life. And ever since then, humans have struggled with that. Christians struggle with that. Who is going to control my life? Is it going to be God or is it, or is it going to be? I want to give you two observations that I've made when putting this message together. And the first one is this. Most things that happen to you and around you, you can't control. Most of the things that happen to you in your life, you have no control over. You cannot control somebody into making them love you. If you ever had a broken relationship, and, and maybe if you've ever went through a divorce, and, and you did not want that, you did not want that relationship to end, and, and you thought, hey, if I can just do this or that, then I can make them love you. And no matter what you did, they would not love you. Hey, you cannot control whether someone will like you or love you. You cannot control your talents and abilities, gifts and looks. I would love to be good looking like Brother Chris, amen, but I'm not. I'm ugly like Dave. 
I'd like to have a head full of hair, but guess what? I don't. I, I would like to be six foot five. I always wanted to be six foot five, but I'm not. I'm five eight. There's nothing I can do about it. I cannot grow to be five eight. I mean six five. I am five eight. I can't control that. You cannot control the family that you're born into. You cannot control the country that you're born into. Don't you know there's a country that, in uh, Ukraine that would give anything if they could have been born to the United States? But you know what? They had no say in it. They could not control that. You cannot control the economy of a nation. You can't control gas prices. You have no control over if it's going to be $10 or $2. You just have to pay whatever they charge. You cannot control food prices. When you go to the grocery store, you just have to pay what they charge or not eat. You cannot control the actions of other people. That was a hard lesson for me. Because I remember, especially early in my ministry, I thought, you know what, if I just preached hard enough, and, and if I was just passionate enough, and I would just tell people exactly what they needed to do, then, then they would listen, and, and I could control what they did, but I come to realize very quickly that you cannot control the actions of other people. You can't control your health. You don't know if you're going to be well this time next week, or if you are not going to be well this time next week. Now, I know you can eat right and do some of those things, but, but ultimately your health is not in your control. You can't control the day you're going to die. The Bible says it's already been written down in the book of God. God knows the exact day that you're going to go to heaven. Listen to me. You cannot control that. Do you think those young people that went to play golf in, in Midland this week and was on their way home to New Mexico, do you think that they had any control of that pickup come crossing the line and in colliding with them head on and all of them going out into eternity. They had no control. You can't control the government. You can get upset, you can rant, you can rave, you can do whatever you want to, but I'm telling you, you cannot control the government. You cannot control the person you're married to. Isn't that right, CJ? I can't control her, and guess what? She can't control me. And the harder that you try to control one another, the less control that you have. Here's one for, a kid, for parents that's got adult children. Guess what? You can't control your adult children. They're going to do what they want to do. And it really doesn't matter how you raise them because I, I've heard it over and over. I've raised them right. I did everything that I could to, to, to make sure they, they grew up and they were the right kind of person. But, but not everyone does that. You cannot control your adult children. And the list could go on and on. If we could just get it in our minds, most of the things that happened around us, we have no control over. The second observation that I want to give you is this. The less control I have of things, the more I want control. I want you to think about that. The less control I have of things, the more I want to control. Hey, when things are turning upside down and things are getting chaotic, the more that I want to control and the more that I want to hold on and the more that I want to make sure that things go the way I want them to go. You know why we do that? Because I trust me more than I trust God. God says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding and all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. I've given you that foundation because I believe that perhaps Peter had that in the back of his mind when he was writing this particular text. Because as I've told you, he's writing to a group of Christians that are scattered throughout the Roman Empire. They are going through difficulties. They're going through trials. The government is dominating them. There is a religious system that is trying to push them down. Many of them have lost their jobs. Some of them have lost their families because they have put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I just know human nature, as all of these things are chaotic around them, these people are wanting to reach out and they are wanting to establish their control over their life instead of trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
So when he starts out verse number 11, he's not writing in an accusing tone. He is not saying, you know what, boy, I'm fixing to get these people. Hey, I'm fixing to put them in their place. I'm fixing to tell them exactly how they ought to live their life. He is not writing that way. He is writing in a very kind, a very loving, kind of a parent talking to a child or a friend and a friend sitting on a, maybe a pickup truck and, and just talking back one another. And, and the, Peter starts out this way, dearly beloved. I urge you, I beseech you, I, I beg you as strangers and pilgrims. The first thing that he says, you know what? You need to realize that this world is not your home. You're a stranger here. You're a pilgrim here. You are just passing through. You read Hebrews chapter number 11, and in that great chapter, you see all of the great heroes of the faith. It is known as the, the hero chapter, and, and you get back, and you sit back, and you think, how did they accomplish all of the things that they accomplished? And it tells us that in verse number 12 through verse number 16, and here is the mindset of all of those heroes. The Bible says they all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. You see, all of those heroes had their eyes upon home. It wasn't a home like you and I live in. But they had their eyes upon heaven. We sing this song, this world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue, the angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. There's a song that I've sung for years, it's called I Call It Home, and and the chorus goes this way, some call it heaven, but I call it home. Some call it dreaming, so let me dream on. Some call it paradise, somewhere beyond the skies. Some call it heaven, but I call it home. Where is your home tonight? Is it the address that you're going to drive up to and get out of your car and go in and sit in your chair? Or is it in heaven? I never forget this story. I've told it here a time or two, and, but I love it. There was a missionary that was overseas, and Teddy Roosevelt had come to that, to, that, to that nation, and this missionary had spent all of his life, 40 or 50 years on the mission field. He had given his life to those people to spread the gospel, and Teddy Roosevelt had come over there just to go hunting. And when they got on the train, the missionary and Teddy Roosevelt both got on the train, and and as they made their way back to the United States, when they got off the train, there was this big crowd that had gathered to welcome Teddy Roosevelt back home. And all he had done is go and hunt a few animals. But there was not one person that was standing at that train station waiting for this missionary. This missionary became discouraged and thought, you know, man, I've, I've given my life to the Lord, and man, I, I've labored, I've risked my health and my family and everything, I, everything that I own to serve the Lord and no one is here to welcome me home and it kind of depressed him and he said this I heard the Lord speak to my heart you're not home yet you know what when I realize that I'm just a stranger here I'm just a pilgrim passing through I, I don't even have any roots here it is a whole lot easier to give up control isn't it that's what Peter is telling these folks. Hey, man, what you see around you, it's not your home. You're just a stranger. You're just a pilgrim. You're just passing through. One of these days you're going to get home. And then he says this. He says, I want you to abstain from fleshly lusts. Galatians chapter 5, verse number 19 through verse number 21, the apostle Paul gives us a, a list of what fleshly lust is. He says it's adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatreds, variance, immolations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murder, drunkenness, reveling, and such like of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in past time, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of heaven. 
When we hear about fleshly lust, that's what we think about. We think about adultery and, and fornication and, and idolatry and all of those things. But I don't think that that is what Peter is talking about in this text because of what he's fixing to talk about. What I think about, he is saying when he says, I want you to abstain from fleshly lust, I think he's telling them, hey, I want you to abstain from that fleshly desire to be in control. He says, it wars against the soul. The more that I seize control of my life and the more that I try to seize control of everything that is around me, the more that I lose joy, the more that I will lose peace, the more that I will lose happiness, the more that I will lose confidence in God. I can't tell you over the years that I pastored how many couples would walk into my office and say, that were going through difficulties and they would say, if that other person would just do what I tell them to do, everything will be okay. But you know what? The harder they tried to hold on, the further they split apart. I can't tell you how many parents over the years that, that's had problems with their children, whether at home or adult children, and they say, you know what? If they will just do what I tell them to do, if, I, if they, I'm just going to make them do this, and the harder you try to control them, the more they slip away. It's the same thing in churches. The more you try to control, the more things slip away. It's the same way at work. The more you try to control things, the, the worse things get. What if we just sit back and say, you know what, God? I'm going to let you take care of this situation. I'll never forget when God really taught me that lesson. I've been pastoring five or six years, and I've, I've, I was always one of those guys. If something came up, I was going to take care of it. I was going to take care of it immediately, and I was going to take care of it where there was no misunderstandings. And God showed me one day, you know what? When you take care of things, you cause a mess. If you'll let me take care of it, I'll take care of it in a way that protects you and is best for everyone that is around you. He goes on in verse number 12. He says, having your conversation, that word conversation is just conduct the way that we live our life. Be honest among the Gentiles. If you say you're a Christian, then live like a Christian. Act like a Christian. If you say that you're trusting in the Lord, then, then live your life the, trusting in the Lord and, and letting Him control it. That, whereas they speak evil, they speak against you as evildoers. Listen to me. When you allow God to control your life and you don't take control, there's people that's going to laugh at you and mock at you and say, hey, you need to do something about this. But if you'll just sit back and say, you know what, God, I'm depending upon you. Notice what the results will be, that your good works which shall behold glorify God in the day of visitation. And then he goes on and he says, you know what, submit. Verse number 18, submit. He talks about Christ, how he submitted. He talks about marriage, how marriage is one of submission. And then he talks about how our Christian conduct should be one of submission. I want you to go with me to Exodus 14, and then I'm through. Exodus chapter number 14, because I want to show you a great passage of Scripture. In Exodus chapter number 14, we know this is the passage where the children of Israel has just left Egypt. They're headed to the promised land, that land that God promised them, that if you'll just go, it's a land that's going to be flowing with milk and honey. And, and I want you to look at verse number 17 of chapter number 13. The Bible says, And it came to pass, when Pharaoh had let the people go, that God led them not through the way of the land of the Philistines, although that it was near. That's really important. Because they could have, God could have taken them the shortest distance. He could have taken them on a journey. I, I think I read several years ago that, that it would have taken them 11 days to go from Egypt to the Canaan land that way. But God said, you know what, I'm not taking you the easy way. I'm not taking you the shortcut. 
the last part of verse number 17, he said, Let's peradventure the people repent when they see war and they return to Egypt. But God led the people about through the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea, and the children of Israel went up hardness out of the land of Egypt. Now I want you to skip over to verse number 6 of chapter number 14. The Bible says, and he made ready his chariots, talking about Pharaoh, and took his people with him. And he took 600 chosen chariots and all the chariots of Egypt and the captains of every one of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued after the children of Israel, and the children of Israel went out with a high hand. But the Egyptians pursued after them, all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh and his horsemen and his army and overtook them and camped them by the sea besides Pharaoh and by Zel Zephron. And when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes and behold, the Egyptians marched after them and they were sore afraid and the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. Now remember that observation that I made? When things kind of get out of control, the more that we want to control things. I think that's what takes place. The, the, the children of Israel are, has an obstacle in front of them. The Red Sea, they, they, they know they're going in the right direction, but, but now there's chaos that is taking place. They don't know what to do. The Egyptians are coming behind them. The Red Sea is in front of them. What are they going to do? Notice what verse number 11 says, And they said unto Moses, Because there was no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt thus with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? Is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. They're saying, boy, if we could just get back to Egypt. If we would have just stayed in Egypt, if we wouldn't have let God in control and, and followed God out of here, man, God's brought us out here and he's going to kill us all. Notice this grace verse, number 13. And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show you today. For the Egyptians whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. The Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. You know what Moses was saying? Let God take over. Let God be in control of this situation. Just sit back and watch God work because he is going to fight the battles for you. Seems like in one of the psalmists there is a verse that goes like this. Be still and know that I'm God. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. And lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. You know what I know? That most of the things that's happening in our country, I don't care how smart you are, how much money you have, there's nothing you can do about it. But I know somebody that can. He's called the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And he says, step aside. Let me be in control, and I'll fight your battles. That's who I won't fight for me. Amen. Let's pray. God, we love you tonight. and Lord, we're grateful for your word. What an encouragement. Moses standing in front of all those people with all kinds of difficulty around them. And Moses just says, hey, be still. Don't do anything. Give your control to the Lord and he'll fight the battles for you. God, tonight, I know that many of us may be worried about the days ahead. But God, I pray that tonight before we leave this place, we'll just say, you know what? I'm giving it back to you, God. I'm just going to trust in you. I'm just going to lean upon you. I'm just going to acknowledge you in everything that I do. 
God will see you do great things. God, I pray that you would have your will and your way in our invitation tonight. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Would you stand with me tonight, please? With heads bowed and eyes closed, Martha and Linda are going to play through a verse of invitation. If God's spoken to you, you come. David, gosh, you've been faithful all day long. I hope you go home and have a good evening and uh, have a good week. Look forward to seeing you back here on Wednesday night. Be sure and sign up if you will. If you're going bowling, please sign up. And uh, also want to mention that uh, the uh, uh, youth auction is coming up. It's right around the corner. Uh, it's going to be just a few weeks away on the 2nd. I've been saying the 3rd. I have that incorrect. I believe it's the 2nd on Sunday night. Uh, and uh, it's the biggest fundraiser we have for the year, so I hope you'll get involved. If you got something that you want to be auctioned off, be sure and let Cooper and Bergen or Matt and Lauren know, and uh, they can kind of uh, anticipate how many uh, items they'll have, okay? All right. Let's go ahead and be dismissed in a word of prayer. Let me just lead us in prayer, and then we'll get, get going. Father, thank you for the day. Thank you for your goodness. Help us, Lord God, to go all week long uh, counting our blessings. Help us, Lord, to look around us and see how good we have it and to be thankful for even the least of, even the smallest of, of, of blessings and comforts we have in our life. And, Lord, each time we give thanks for that, let us be reminded also, Father, that there are people hurting across the water from us, Lord. There are people suffering. There are people, Lord God, good people on uh, uh, Russian soil and, and Ukraine soil and many other areas of our world. Lord, that are in pain and suffering. And I pray, Father, that Christians all over will be praying. We pray that you would reveal yourself to those who are lost, that you will uh, show yourself to be good, that you'll show yourself to be gracious and merciful, Lord, to those that, uh, that would look to you. And I just pray, God, that you'll open the eyes of this lost world that they might, through tra uh, tragedy, uh, see the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, bless Patsy and Jerry, their family, as they, they grieve the loss of her brother. Uh, Father, bless our people as they go to work tomorrow. Help us all to be a shining light. Thank you for this good message tonight, Lord God. And you are in control. We want to let you have control, Lord, and forgive us when we uh, uh, struggle with that. Lord, help us to just trust. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.